Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. It is a privilege and an honor, Heavenly Father, to have in our hands the infallible and errant word which you have given to us for the purpose of informing us as to what you think in your mind and giving us direction for our own lives to live here in the hostile environment of the devil's world system. Now may God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son as we study together and help believers to assimilate these things, apply them, and to advance spiritually to the place where they can become spiritually self-sustaining and spiritually mature in the middle of all of the changing circumstances and situations around us. May God the, the Son receive honor and glory, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we have progressed in the word-by-word, verse-by-verse study of Galatians chapter 1 through Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. And we come now to the final words of verse 3, and our Lord... Jesus Christ. We have three words which make up this title. The first is kurios, which is translated Lord. The second is Iesus, I-E-S-O-U-S, which is Jesus. And the third is Christos, C-H-R-I-S-T-O-S, -S, Christ. This, of course, is the name of his humanity. It is not a name which is uncommon in Judaism. It's the same as uh, Joshua. It's the same as Hosea. They're, they are the same names. It just depends on how they are written, uh, how they are written. They're, it's exactly the same. And it means that uh, Yahweh, or God, saves. That's the meaning of the name. The name was dictated by the angel when uh, he told Mary, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. This is the name, then, of his humanity, for the Lord Jesus Christ is truly a man like every other member of the human race, except for one thing. Because of the fact that he was born of a virgin, this meant that his mother, Mary, the mother of his humanity, became pregnant not by means of human uh, resource, but God the Holy Spirit caused the Lord Jesus Christ to begin to form inside of her womb. And this was necessary because the old sin nature is passed on by the Father. And uh, anyone with a human father is going to have an old sin nature. Since our Lord Jesus Christ did not have a human father, therefore he did not have an old sin nature, and he was consequently born without the, a target for the imputation of Adam's sin. So he was born without the old sin nature and without a target for the imputation of Adam's sin, so he was born without sin. 
the only member of the human race who was born that way. Adam was created that way. But the Lord Jesus Christ was born that way. He is also, however, God. Kurios speaks of his deity. Co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in his deity. He has always existed. There is never a time in which he was not. He and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit all three have eternally existed as the triune God. We studied that briefly. But he is different than God the Father and different than God the Spirit in that he is also perfect humanity. So he is the unique person of the universe. The word Christ speaks of his anointing. It simply means anointed. And the anointing refers to the people of the Jews, and his place as the, the Messiah uh, of Israel who had been promised uh, in eternity past. So we're talking about this fantastic, unique person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I guess I go back to the old school at Moody, uh, where we very rarely referred to him without using his whole title. Uh, you can always, you travel around the world and meet some missionaries who've been serving in the backwoods somewhere for years and years, and uh, you start talking about the Savior, and if they refer to him as the Lord Jesus Christ, chances are they're from Moody Bible Institute. <laughs> Not so much anymore. Times change, things change, and I'm not saying it's for the worst or for the better. I'm simply saying that times do change, and uh, they don't, uh, this does not characterize the Institute any longer. But the, uh, those of us who go back a number of years, uh, nobody ever made it a rule. Nobody ever said that it had to be that way. It was just the way that we uh, would recognize the the unique person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we know that the grace and the peace that precedes uh, in this verse uh, says uh, came from the ultimate source of God our Father. We have the, the uh, preposition apo, which is the preposition of ultimate source, telling us that this grace and peace comes from God the Father, but also, also from the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, God the Son. See, God the Father, as we have just completed studying in the doctrine of Paterology, is the grantor of the grace and the peace. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the executive who dispenses grace and peace. And so it is right that these two should come together. After all, the second Corinthians 5:19 says that God, really referring to God the Father, was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now ordinarily when we study these scriptures and we come to a word such as we have with the word apostle, uh, the word uh, church, the word grace, the word peace, the word God our Father, we stop and study the categorical doctrine which is related to that subject. And that means that we would ordinarily launch into a study of Christology at this point. Now, because of the fact that so many of the other doctrines that are, uh, we have studied and will study are related to Christology, we will not take the time to go through uh, the, the uh, Christology as a systematic doctrine. Uh, I have included it in the book, uh, the, uh, the, the outline which comes from Lewis Berry Chafer's Systematic Theology. And I would encourage those who are listening or watching by television to write and ask for Galatians chapter 1, verse, uh, uh, volume 1, which contains the, uh, the scripture exegesis and the categorical doctrines related to everything from the introduction through verse 10. 
So this is a uh, complete book ready for you to write for uh, and uh, use. Eventually, we will have the whole book of Galatians as we do the entire book of uh, uh, Romans and eventually all of Colossians in, in uh, form so that you can have your own uh, library of exegetical uh, books on these, uh, these passages of Scripture. So we will not take the time to go through the entire uh, pass the the entire doctrine of Christology, uh, but uh, someday, uh, who knows? I may even go into one of the Gospels and do it that way. And so we move on now to Galatians chapter one, verse four, which says in the New International Standard Version who, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father. Verse 5, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we begin with the genitive masculine singular from the definite article, uh, T-O-U, two. Now, uh, um, two... Uh, uh, being a definite article should be translated the one when it is used here as a pronoun. The one who, and then we have the aorist active participle from this Greek word, didomi, D-I-D-O-M-I. -I. Didomi means to graciously give. That without reference to uh, earning or deserving. This is the aorist active participle. The aorist tense refers to an occurrence in the past. It doesn't have any reference to uh, time, but it is uh, a uh, uh, something that has taken place. The active voice, the subject, the Lord Jesus Christ, produces the action of the verb. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who graciously gave. The participle, uh, the action of the aorist participle precedes the action of the main verb. It's very helpful in exegesis to understand this because the action of the main verb, with the main verb is that he might deliver. The point is that he gave, graciously gave himself at the cross, in, uh, that he might deliver us. But he could never deliver us if he hadn't gone to the cross. The cross was necessary for him to deliver us. But the, the, the whole thing puts, goes together to prove that salvation comes from God to us and never the other way around. It's always from God to man. Man never has any part in earning or deserving his own salvation. He doesn't have any part in working his way to heaven. He doesn't do the best that he can and then leave the rest with God. He doesn't uh, trust in his, his efforts. As a matter of fact, it's very important that uh, that be discounted, and that's why the apostle is laying such a strong, firm foundation here, because he's dealing with uh, the two great problems which the church at Galatia faced. The first problem is addressed in verse 1. Paul, an apostle not from men or by men. His apostleship, which referred to his authority. What authority has the apostle Paul to uh, tell these people that uh, they are wrong in what they're doing? And the second thing that they are, and the, this is what they're wrong uh, in, and that is they are confused as to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll say it a number of times until you may uh, find it burned into your memory. Almost every heresy, anything which is not orthodox, as far as doctrine is concerned, can be traced back to Christology or soteriology, which is related to the Christology. That is, a, a false concept of the person, a mistaken concept of the work of... Uh, God the Son, the second person of the Godhead, 
who bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Then we have with us the third person reflexive pronoun, which looks like this. H-E-A-U-T-O-U. Now, heautu uh, means himself, and that's, the, I mean, the correct translation, himself. Uh, the, the, what he is saying is, the one who graciously gave himself. Please note, he gave himself, as it says in John 10, 18. Uh, no, he, the Lord Jesus speaks. He says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Our Lord Jesus Christ was not a pawn, a helpless pawn, on the chessboard of life, his substitutionary death was planned in eternity past by God the Father. And when it was time for him to go to Jerusalem, we read, he set his face as a flint, which is a, he a Hebrew idiom, which indicates was an unchangeable thing. He set his life to fulfill. He, was, he went to Jerusalem regardless of what anybody had to say. That was where he was going. So he goes on. This verse says, The one, and the aorist tense here goes back to refer to, because uh, I sir, said an occurrence. Okay, it is a once and for all occurrence. Uh, he once and for all uh, gave himself graciously. Uh, and that is very important. The Galatians needed a reminder right here at the very beginning that they have ignored the atoning, substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. This led them to be susceptible to the false teaching that came in from the source of the Judaizers or the legalizers. You call them either one, that's the same thing. The, uh, the legalizers or the Judaizer, the, uh, the Judaizers is what they were trying to get them to go back to, and the, legal, the legalizers would be a reference to the law uh, of, the, of the Jews, uh, which was what they were to be returned to. So these are synonymous terms, legalizers or Judaizers. But do you ever stop to realize how many times the Scripture says, know this, or do not be ignorant of this, or concentrate on that? The necessity of knowing something. Knowing particularly the person and work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is vital. The one having once and for all graciously given himself, prepositional phrase, who pair, plus the genitive plural of hamartia. H-U-P-E-R-H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A. -A now, who pair is a, a beautiful, beautiful preposition. It means on behalf of, for the benefit of. The Lord Jesus Christ graciously gave himself on behalf of and for the benefit of our hamartia, which is the word for sins. Very important. Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says, He was delivered over to death because of our sins and was raised again because of our justification. Romans 5, 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died 
on our behalf who pair. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And because the wages of sin is death, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9b says, Now our Lord Jesus Christ was now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You and I are under the condemnation of death. The soul that sinneth it must surely die is the condemnation of death. And the Lord Jesus Christ died, he tasted death, on behalf of every member of the human race so that you do not have to die. You do not have to taste death. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, to become sin who pair on behalf of and for the benefit of us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In him we are righteous, not in ourselves. It is not due to our own goodness. It has to do with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As John Eady points out in his commentary, both the freeness of the self-gift is prominent as well as its infinite value. You have two things that are brought out in this beautiful passage. The freeness of the gift and uh, the infinite value of that gift. For there is no other way that a man or a woman or a human race could ever find release from the sin problem. There is no way apart from the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He adds, the doctrine taught is that Jesus Christ did spontaneously offer himself as the one propitiation or satisfaction so that he is the source of grace and peace. And the inference is because he gave himself, the oblation or the sacrifice is perfect as also the deliverance secured by it so that obedience to the law as a means of salvation, is incompatible with faith in Him. The sacrifice is so valuable and was given so freely that there is no room for anyone to add human works to what has already been accomplished. The Lutheran scholar R.C.H. Lenski brings out another important reason for the inclusion in this statement. Nothing removes sin save the self-sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Through that sacrifice alone, grace and peace are ours. Problem, the Galatians were listening to a different doctrine. Yes, they were. We'll see it beginning in verse 6. We have already alluded to it in the introduction. Along came some impressive people. Dear old Dr. So-and-so, someone with a, a tremendous pedigree behind his name, all kinds of letters. Back at Studi Bible Institute, we used to add a U to all of the degrees. Just put a U in there so that the Ph.D. becomes a FUD, an M.D. becomes a MUD, a D.D. becomes a DUD, Doctor of Divinity, see. That's, that just shows, uh, well, shows our youthful contempt. I will tell you this, it's been a few years since I've been there, I'm going to tell you one thing, I haven't changed my mind at all. I'm still adding the U's. Still adding the U's. But the point is that these people were very impressive. Now that doesn't absolve the Galatians from their responsibility of falling for the, the message. But they should never have given it a listen to in the first place. Kenneth Wiest, my favorite mentor at Moody, and still today one of the most, uh, I regard one of the most highly regarded Greek 
teachers in the, in the United States, he's with the Lord for a number of years now, observes, here Paul brings to the attention of the Galatian Christians who were practically ignoring the substitutionary character of the atoning death of the Lord Jesus, a declaration of the true ground of acceptance with God. This was purposely added because the Galatians were falling back on works as the ground of such acceptance. There's no way, beloved, that a human being, hopeless, helpless, spiritually dead, spiritually brain dead, totally depraved, member of the human race, can deal with his sins. You can't promise God you'll never do them again. You cannot promise God that they're behind you. You cannot uh, uh, atone for your own sins. God and God alone initiated a perfect plan whereby God the Son bore all of the penalty for your sin and mine in His body on the cross. So it is that the songwriter had to say, uh, Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. We'll see the deviation from this in verse 6, but we move on now to the verse 4, uh, as he continues, he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one having once and for all graciously given himself on behalf of and for the benefit of our sins to rescue us from the present evil age. The word rescue is the verb that's very important. It is the aorist middle subjunctive. From the Greek verb ex ireo, looks like this. E X A I R E O. And it means to pluck out, it means to draw out, it means to deliver, it means to rescue. This aorist tense, please note, is not a future tense. We're not talking about a future tense. You see, he didn't uh, uh, die to rescue us when we die from this earth. He didn't uh, do it to rescue us at his second advent or even at the rapture. That's not what he, it's being talked about here. This aorist tense refers uh, to the point of time of his substitutionary atoning death on the cross and at that very time is when uh, he pr produced for us the deliverance from this evil, present evil age. And we'll deal with that uh, meaning, uh, the meaning of that in, a, in just a moment. But it's, it's thrilling to see that the aorist tense uh, refers to something which is, some, it's a completed action. It's something that is finished. It's not something which is still future. It's completed. He has rescued us. Now, there are some people who don't know that and don't care about it, so they are still a part of the evil age. They are still influenced by the evil age. That's their privilege. That's the free will of, of God, of man, that God has uh, sovereignly determined uh, he should have. But uh, uh, the, this is a completed action. The middle voice is reflexive. The subject is the Lord Jesus Christ in this case. He did it for himself. He rescued us for himself. That is, we are to be his own, his own unique possession. We belong to him. The songwriter said, I'm his and his forever. He has won me by his grace. I'm His. That we should henceforth not live to ourselves or live for ourselves, but unto Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. It gives a new direction to my life. 
I'm not living for myself any longer because I have been purchased with the price. The subjunctive mood is potential. Remember this, while the death of Jesus Christ is effective for the entire human race, it is efficient only for those who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior from sin in order to be eternally saved. The doctrine of unlimited atonement tells us in 1 John 2.2 2, that he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, paid the penalty for all sin, meaning this, Beloved, no one will ever be sent to hell because he's a sinner. No matter how bad a sinner he or she may be, you will never be sent to hell because you're a sinner. The only reason anyone will go to hell is because they have failed to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. John 3:18. Whoever does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, at this point, is a good place to stop and ask you if you have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Note the question is not this, are you a member of a church? Nor is the question, have you been baptized? Or have you been catechized? Or have you been sanferized or whatever else? I... No, the question is this. Have you come to the point in your life where you have placed your faith for eternal salvation in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary? That's the question. If not, there is no better time than right now. And there's no better place than where you are because you don't have to go to a church. You can. You could be in this auditorium right now and need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you could do it. You may be listening in your car right now and you can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have to bow your head and close your eyes. Please don't if you're driving. We don't want you to do that. You, be, you exhale faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And in that point of time, God will do 40 wonderful things for you. And I would like to do, to, I'd like to send you a couple of booklets. The first is this little booklet entitled, Now That I Believe. It explains what takes place when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you're here and you don't know the Lord, stop up and get one or take one from the literature rack before you leave. Now That I Believe, it tells you several things you don't do in order to be saved. It gives you actually nine things you cannot do to be saved. It tells you what you do do to be saved and then gives you some suggestions as to what you should do next. You also will receive the booklet entitled Eternal Security, for it is this booklet that describes the fact that once you are saved, you can never, under any circumstances, lose that salvation. It is yours and yours forever. And at the same time, unknown to you and unfeeling by you, you receive 40 things that come from the blessing of God in your life, the 40 blessings of God's grace. These three little books will be sent to you without charge or obligation, and no one will call on you. While you must realize, however, that God has been preparing your heart so that right now is the right time. You have heard this message at this time. God has been getting you ready. That's why he says that uh, there is a time, there's a right time. Uh, and that time is when you hear him call, and you're hearing him call. You're receiving God's invitation at this point in time, in your soul, God's invitation to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And that means that right here and now, when, when the Bible says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, call ye upon him while he is near, it simply means that there will be a time in your life, and if, if, if you're right in the, this point now where you're hearing the gospel, this is the time when you are ready, when you are prepared when you are ripe for believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, there will come a day in your life when uh, you, uh, you may again uh, have the urge to be saved 
after you've gone through many years of heartache and heartbreak and uh, difficulty, uh, and uh, you may come to the end of your rope and find that it's greased, you have no place to turn, and therefore you turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But why not avoid those things? Call upon the Lord while he may be found. Uh, that is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ even uh, today. What a graphic picture is painted by the words uh, to rescue, isn't it? Uh, all of us uh, think in terms of uh, some kind of rescue, and almost every month, uh, what a temptation it was for me, uh, every month Reader's Digest has at least one or more uh, story of uh, some uh, heroic rescue that was uh, given to somebody uh, uh, because of uh, uh, the heroism of someone else. And there are so many of these that uh, I would be tempted to read, take the, the whole time just to tell uh, the various stories. Uh, one of the most recent ones was uh, uh, told of uh, two young men who were cave explorers in, in South America. And uh, they went down into this cave, uh, uh, though they uh, uh, were not real greatly experienced in certain types of caves, they went down into the cave and they, the rope that they were uh, tied to uh, came loose and as they went through the cave swimming, they had a tank, they had oxygen tanks, they were underwater, uh, and uh, they uh, had uh, uh, wetsuits and all. But as they went, they stirred up the dust with their fins, uh, the, the, the ground, and they couldn't see anything. They just, it was just a mass. One of them made his way back, and the other one made a wrong turn and crawled into a cavern. And there he sat uh, uh, in, this, in this area. And uh, they, uh, uh, someone decided to contact uh, a, a, a cave explorer with years of experience from Florida and ask him to fly down to South America. And this man and his friend flew down to South America. And by this time, everyone thought this, this, the one who was in the cave had to be dead by now because it was going on four days that he was in that cave without uh, uh, food, in the total darkness, and d darkness is supposed to drive you mad within 24 hours, uh, and he uh, didn't have enough to keep him alive. The two men waved, and uh, uh, they had looked at the map, had been drawn previously, and they found this fellow alive. Uh, and uh, the only thing he was uh, hypothermic, and they were able to actually bring him out uh, from this cave, much to the re rejoicing of himself and his family. But... Uh, the gospel is a rescue and emancipation from a state of bondage. Uh, he has rescued us from the power of the present world system. Now, when we talk about the word world system, we're talking about two different Greek words which at some times are synonyms. One is this word in the Greek, K-O-S. M-O-S. The other is this word, A-I-O-N-O-S. This is cosmos. This is ionos. Uh, Archbishop Trench, years ago, I wish some would up because there are so many more, a book entitled Sin New Testament. He tries to take words used as sin to point out the very, very distinct difference between these words. And they did do one good thing. In the volume that I have, uh, uh, some of the quotes, uh, well, new words, they have uh, the Latin, so that, uh, as uh, understand the change, uh, the, the Latin quote they have made. Uh, it's a very important that it's a thing between faith and faith love, for example. People are always saying, God is God's love and faith is love. No, no, I just cleared that away, and anybody who has the uh, book would, would be fun. Archbishop French, in his book, uh, in, de in defining the word ionos, says, this is all voting mass of thoughts, Opinions, maxims, speculations, hopes, impulses, aims, aspirations, at any time current in the world, which it may be impossible to seize and accurately define, but constitute a most real and effective power being the moral or immoral atmosphere which at a moment in our lives again inevitably to exhale. 
Demos is the world system, which is a horde system under the control of Satan, with all of the involved in, and uh, this is often sometimes as it ages, because it's, it's dealing more with uh, the uh, the philosophic part and rather than the physical uh, or of the world system. But uh, the word would be better translated age then, because uh, uh, it refers to the present court with the underlying idea of its corruption, its fullness. Uh, the uh, cosmologus is filled with the ionos. The ionos is rampant in the cosmos. Now, uh, this, this world system is hostile to anything which is in reference to God. The election of 1992, which took place on November the 3rd, was very shocking, not because of the persons necessarily who were elected, but more on the philosophies which about to mankind, to the, to the United States of America, to the people of the United States of America. Christians should realize that the pivot from this election, the pivot is shrinking smaller and smaller, indicating that the destruction of the United States of America is not far away. God will not, will not tolerate this kind of a nation in Italy. And since the pivot has no invisible impact whatsoever because it's a law anymore. There is no invisible impact. Uh, the Republican Party uh, at their convention, whether it was or not, stood family values. And uh, the polls report that only 42% of Americans think that, uh, that, that uh, family values uh, have any importance at all. That's a copy on the IOS, the, the image of, of the not dealer in expertise. And it is going in the towel. There are other things which are important. There are because of any part of the solution problem. Where is the pivot at this point? The pivot be to God, but there are too many up there important. And more than the pivot has lost its purpose. And having lost its purpose, it's no longer the source of a citizen than the old Anas. It was the old world. The opinion of speculated folks, you can ask me, none of which is to please God. To anything to do with God, everything has to do with men. Well, what? Which is used in the, is the word and is E S C or to be used in contrast with that which was past. This is a perfect part simple here, as intense or word present. John E. says meaning of the verse is that the purpose is self sacrificed rescue believers, but it's going to peril them. Kingdom God. And the new addition says that the change is not in the first instance one of character, as all means are, but one of state or relation, having reference rather to justification. Though change of relation most certainly implies or entails a change of character. Believers are rescued out of this present age with all of its evils of curse, corruption, sins, and selfishness. Not by being removed from the earth, but by being translated into another age, accepted, blessed, adopted, regenerated. John tells us in 1 John 5, 19, the whole cosmos is under the control of the evil one. And the emphasis is that the one who is born of God will not go along with what this world system stands for. This world system is, is an enemy of grace. It's an enemy of God. It's not that which helps us along. I challenge you to find one television program, just one, that advances even...